Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about Howard Baskerville. An American man in the early 20th century went to Persia to teach, but inevitably joined rebels to fight for a constitutional monarchy. The name Howard Baskerville would be remembered and revered in Iran for the next 70 years until the Iranian Revolution of 1979 and the fallout between the United States and Iran there afterwards. Howard Baskerville is now a name largely forgotten in both Iran and the United States. My guest for this conversation is trying to change that. My guest is Reza Aslan. Reza Aslan is a claimed writer and scholar of religion. He's the author of a number of books, including his latest that we'll be in conversation about. It's called An American Martyr in Persia, The Epic Life and Tragic Death of Howard Baskerville. Reza Aslan, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to this radio program. It's great to be back, Mitch. Thanks for having me. Now, in the past, we've had you on the show a number of times. We've talked about some of my favorite shows, actually, The Radical Politics of Jesus Christ, The Origins of the Ideas of of God, Cosmic Battles, you name it. This book that you're writing now seems different, though. Uh, Why did you embark on telling the story of Howard Baskerville? This is a story that, you know, has been rattling around my head as long as I can remember, you know, it's, it's almost as though I've always known his name and the bare facts of his life. In many ways, I'm the last generation of Iranians really, uh, who would have any idea who this kid was, but I didn't know that much about him. I knew that he was an American and I knew that he was a missionary. And I knew that he had fought and died in Iran's first revolution, the so-called constitutional, uh, the Persian constitutional revolution. Um, but that was it. That was kind of all uh, all I knew about him. And by the time I came to the United States after the Iranian revolution, um, I had more or less forgotten even that much about him. And certainly, as I say in the book, his name was more or less wiped from all the history books in Iran after that revolution. And so it it wasn't until I was older that his name kind of resurfaced every once in a while here and there. And I began to really delve into some research to figure out who this kid was. And sadly, what I discovered was what little I knew about him was pretty much all anyone knew about this kid. Um, And it wasn't until I began looking at the Persian documents, Persian language documents, a lot of Russian language documents, actually. Um, And then really finding a a treasure trove of information in the archives of the Presbyterian Historical Society that his life and this incredible adventure that he had started to come into full focus. And I just knew I had to tell this story. And you were born in Iran in 1972. So as a kid, you you, you had known of his name. I guess most kids at that time still would have known of his name. Yeah, you know, um, I've been told now recently that the reason I knew his name is because of my social and economic class. That's what I was told. I thought everybody knew his name. You know, uh, when I was a kid, there were schools named Howard Baskerville. There, there. I believe to this day, there's still one street in uh, Tehran that's called Howard Baskerville. Um, there were coffee shops, you know, his name was just kind of all over the place. So it's a name that you would confront, that you would see, and maybe you knew who who he was, or maybe you didn't, but it, the name itself is, I think, what was familiar to me, much more so than anything about his biography. Howard Baskerville was born in 1885 died in 1909 so he died a young man he died fighting in this revolution in right. iran okay. um yeah. in 1909 that's why you, when you call him a kid he, he was some 24 <laughs> years old or so uh yeah. when, when he died um tell me about iran in the early and i say in the early 20th century and i say iran but we're calling it persia at this point we wouldn't start calling iran iran until what after 1935 is that significant okay. in this is that significant to know well, it's significant in so far as this is a time in which so all Iranians would refer to Iran as Iran, but everyone else called it Persia. That was its sort of official name. And I think there's something symbolic there because this was a time in which 
Iran had absolutely no control over its destiny as a country. Iran, as most you know, people who have any sense of the history know, was never a colonized um, country. It was never like India or you know or Iraq next door. Um, but it was a country that essentially became the staging ground for the so-called great game between the Russian and the British empires. They had carved up the country into two zones of influence. The Russians controlled the north and, and the British controlled the south. So it wasn't direct colonialism, but it was a situation in which the national affairs of the country were really being run by outsiders. And it was very easy to do so because you only needed to control one man, the Shah. Um, this was the Qajar dynasty, so it was the the, the penultimate dynasty in Iran. Uh, it would eventually be replaced by the Pahlavi dynasty, which is the dynasty that was uh, overthrown uh, in the the revolution of 1979. But the Qajar Shahs were these kind of, you know, out of touch, fattened. Uh, kings who lived in these marble palaces and who essentially were able to sustain themselves by taking out n hundreds of thousands of dollars in unpayable loans from the British and the Russians, thereby, you know, keeping uh, the country essentially in the pocket of these two empires. And the revolution in 1906 was ostensibly to create a constitution the first such constitution in the Middle East. This was the first democratic revolution in the Middle East. It was long before the Young Turk Revolution. And indeed, the Young Turks were motivated by what happened in, in Iran. And it was to create a parliament so that you would have a legislature that would give some voice to the people. But it was fundamentally about gaining some measure of control over the country's own destiny. Uh, this is a country that had been basically parceled off to these empires by a succession of ever out of touch um, and ever ruthless shahs. So this was really a national revolution. And indeed, historians will tell you it was in this revolution of 1905-1906 where the very concept of Persian nationalism arose. You know, before that, it'd be hard to say that, he, that you know, the people in the country actually thought of themselves as, you know, a, a unified nation state with a single national identity. There are a lot of ethnicities and tribes and religions. But this revolution is what really created what we now understand to be the Iranian national identity. It was an incredibly important revolution. And this is the environment in which Howard Baskerville would wind up in Iran. Uh, however, he went to Iran to teach and also to preach the gospel, not necessarily to fight a revolution. Yeah, so, you know, this kid, he's the son and grandson of Presbyterian preachers uh, from the Midwest. He goes to Princeton in order to study Christian ministry so he could follow in the footsteps of his father and his grandfather. He arrives at Princeton at an auspicious time. He arrives in Princeton in the midst of this kind of educational revolution that had taken place at the hands of the newly appointed president of Princeton, Woodrow Wilson, who has an, a lot of faults, this man. Uh, you know, it's really hard to talk about Woodrow Wilson without beginning with the fact that he was an unrepentant racist and died as such. But he also had this kind of expansive idea of... Um, of freedom and democracy. He truly believed that these were God's gift to human beings, that that the fate of all nations was to live in freedom and, and to have the ability to have a say in the decisions that mark their lives. And so he was a, an incredibly popular professor. And so when you know, it was time for Howard Baskerville in his junior year to take his two uh, necessary electives. He took these two courses with Woodrow Wilson in jurisprudence and in international government and just heard a version of this kind of fusion of religion and politics that he had never heard before. And it lit a fire underneath him. And so when he graduated, rather than go back to South Dakota where his family was and, and you know get some job teaching at some small church somewhere. 
he decided that he would spend a couple of years going out into the world, preaching the gospel, um, but also, you know, experiencing it, like understanding what the rest of the world was like in, in this kind of sort of, you know, internationalism that was that was fed into him by, by Woodrow Wilson. He desperately, desperately wanted to go to China or Japan. In fact, he wrote numerous letters to the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions and said, I'm, I'm, I really think Christ wants me to go to China. Like I've, I've talked to Jesus and he, he wants me to go to China. That's where I feel like my, my uh, skills can be best uh, served for the kingdom of God. And much to his chagrin, he gets posted to Persia, which is a place that he has no interest in going at all. And what happens when he gets to Persia? Well, first of all, he finds out that everything that he had heard about Persia was wrong. He'd been he reading these uh, terrible reports about the the you know how all, how terrible the Persian culture is, how oppressive Persian society is. Uh, you know the 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 solid wall of Mohammedanism that refuses to budge. You know, uh, and so he goes there really nervous and scared, and ends up discovering a country that is beautiful and full of life. He absolutely falls in love with the country and the culture, the food especially. Um, he strikes up deep, deep personal friendships with a number of the fellow Persian faculty at the school, at the missionary school that he's there to teach. He falls in love with his students. He becomes almost instantly the most popular uh, teacher at the school. He even literally falls in love. He falls in love with the daughter of the headmaster of the school. So he, for that first year, is having the time of his life. This is exactly the grand adventure that he was hoping to have but about halfway through his time there um the the shah who signed the constitution and allowed for a parliament dies and his son uh a, a man by the name of muhammad ali muhammad ali shah not not that muhammad ali um decides that his father made a mistake so he tears up the constitution he rolls his russian cannons to the house of the parliament building uh and destroys it with the parliamentarian still inside and he very quickly recaptures the entirety of the country back in the name of the crown every city every province except one tabriz the city in which baskerville resides and so this city that he's come to love becomes the center of this anti-imperialist revolution. And so he's now looking outside of his class window and all of the theoretical, you know, things that he had studied with Woodrow Wilson about revolutions and freedom and democracy and constitutionalism and international law and popular sovereignty is actually taking place <laughs> in front of him. And yet he is continually told by both the Presbyterian Church and the State Department that it's none of his business, that he has his job there is to save souls, not lives, that the U.S. government can have no role to play whatsoever in this revolution because it's bound to fail anyway. Uh, Islam implies autocracy, the State Department memo tells everyone. So do not support this revolution because it, it's going to fail. And so for a while, he has no choice but to just put his head down, do his job, and ignore what is going on all around him. I was going to save this question for later, but let me get to it now because I'm, I, I, I assume there's going to be some listeners who are going to be listening to this and be thinking and maybe even seeing it through a lens of today and thinking of Western influence in the region, the, the push for... Democracy. You talked about the connection of Howard Baskerville yeah. to Woodward, uh, Woodrow Wilson um, and be thinking about the long arm of Western imperialism and the, and the idea to push for a constitutional monarchy. What, what would your response to be to someone who might be viewing it in that lens? Well, I mean, it sounds like the most uh, perfectly wrought white savior story, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> like, here is this like 
privileged 22 year old white kid with a Princeton degree who you know goes out to to save you know the the dark uh, you know people of the Muslim world and that's exactly how this story begins that's essentially what happens and it's this incredible moment where suddenly everything changes so in the winter of 1909 the shah sends his russian trained troops and russian commanders to tabriz to get rid of the last thing that's standing between him and full control of the country again there is a sort of really ruthless uh, attack on the city but the city survives the city will not surrender no matter what and so the shah changes tactics and by the sort of middle of winter of 1909 he decides that if he can't defeat tabriz he'll just starve it to death and so he draws a circle of troops around the city cuts off all water cuts off all food and just waits for you know the 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 population to just die and what takes place next is this historical moment in Iranian history called the Siege of Tabriz, an absolutely horrific uh, humanitarian crisis where thousands and thousands of people, men, women, children, babies, uh, begin to just slowly starve and die in the streets. And again, Baskerville is told, none of your business. This is not what you're here for. Again. You're here to save souls, not lives. Yes, of course, it's a terrible situation. And yes, spiritually, of course, we're on the side of the people and not on the side of the Shah. And we'll do whatever we can to alleviate their suffering. But it's not your business. He's told right? this by the U.S. government. He's told this by the Presbyterian Church, the mission that sent him there, and by the U.S. government. Yes, the U.S. government has made it very clear anybody who takes part in this will be dealt with by American law. And it's at that moment that the sort of traditional white savior narrative starts to break down a little bit. Because the white savior narrative is all about, you know, the white man of privilege taking part in small acts of charity uh, without the agency of the people that you're trying to help ignoring the underlying uh, root causes of the problem, often those root causes being the direct responsibility of the white person of privilege anyway, and you know, their country, and doing all of this in order to, you know, gain some emotional validation of your privilege to begin with. That's, that's the white savior narrative. And until this moment, that's the narrative that Baskerville is living. But the suffering that he sees on the streets wakes him up and he realizes, A, I'm responsible for this because it's my country that is refusing to support, you know, these people who are begging for the most basic rights, rights that I take for granted. I'm responsible for this because I'm sitting here spouting the gospel of Jesus Christ without actually putting that gospel into practice at all. I'm talking about what Jesus would do, but I'm not doing what Jesus would do. And I'm responsible for this because I can, as an American citizen, protected by my passport, do or say whatever I want to and face no repercussions or consequences. And so he makes this fateful decision. He quits his teaching position he abandons his missionary post, and ultimately, he gives up his American citizenship. Gives and up his citizenship. That's, that's right. Not insignificant. Yeah. He voluntarily, he volunt he's told in the midst of this, the State Department, the, the Consul General in the city of Tabriz comes to him and says, in no uncertain terms, if you do not cease these activities and return home, you will be arrested for treason. He uses the word treason. And Baskerville's response is, this is what it means to be American. And if you don't understand that, then here's my passport. And he just hands it over. 
the church tells him, this is, you know, not why you were here. You are, you are, you know, essentially threatening your immortal soul in what you're doing. And his response is, this is what Jesus would do. Jesus would pick up a gun and save these people. And that's what I'm going to do. And suddenly in this kind of, you know, odd way, the entire white savior narrative flips on its head because here's this kid who instantly recognizes his privilege, instantly recognizes his role in perpetuating the trauma that he is there to address, and then strips all of that privilege away and allows the people that he had come to serve to tell him what they need. And what they need is for him to help, to, for him to pick up a gun, stand shoulder to shoulder with them, and defeat the Shah in the name of you know, their, their rights. And that's what he does. It's, an, it's, a, it's a remarkable story. In fact, one sort of anecdote about this, when he goes to tell his students um, on his last day of, of uh, being their teacher, he says, I can no longer teach you, you know, these things while just outside the window, there are people suffering and dying for the rights that I take for granted that I'm sitting here teaching you about, you know, theoretically. And so the only way I know how to help you anymore is to give up my job and go join the revolution. And remarkably, in this kind of incredible, like sort of made for Hollywood moment, the students stand up and follow him onto the battlefield. They also join the revolution, much to, as you can imagine, the chagrin of their parents and the the st school uh, administrators. So this is no Gertrude Bell story or, or even a T.E. Lawrence story. It's sort of the antidote to those stories, right? Uh, it's the story of a white man of privilege who, when confronted with that privilege, strips himself of it and puts himself, gives, gives over his agency to the people that he was there to serve in the first place. And, and honestly, that is a, a model <laughs> that we could really use right now, not just Americans, but specifically American Christians. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Reza Aslan. He is the author of the book, An American Martyr in Persia, The Epic Life and Tragic Death of Howard Baskerville. I, I can't help but follow up what you just said there, especially American Christians. What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, look, I don't need to tell you that we're at a place right now in which Christianity, first of all, um, is at its lowest percentage in the United States. We are, I think, approaching about 64% of the American population that declares itself Christian. That's the lowest it has ever been since the founding of this country. And you don't have to guess why, right? We have had decades in which evangelical Christianity, which is what Howard Baskerville was, he was an evangelical Christian, an evangelical Protestant, where evangelical Christianity has essentially married itself, not just to the right wing of this country, but to the absolute worst elements of the right wing. We have a so-called moral majority who has spent decades telling the rest of us that their morality is what should run you know, the laws of this country, and then married itself to the orange embodiment of the seven deadly sins, right? The incarnation of every woe that Jesus talked about, um, and did so for in exchange for rank power. That's it. Just did so for power um, that has turned you know, the religion into essentially a cult of personality at this point. Uh, we're living at a time in which that morality has now become a way of forcing um, their particular views and interpretations of their religion upon the majority of the country, whether we want it or not. And so, you know, as a brand, if you will, <laughs> American evangelical Christianity is about as toxic as it gets right now. And here's a kid who believed the exact same things that these, you know, American evangelicals do, but who had 
this kind of revelatory moment where he realized, to quote, you know, the, the New Testament, that faith without works is dead. You can talk all you want to about what you think Jesus would do. But until you actually do what Jesus would do, until you are willing to sacrifice yourself for other people, for their most basic rights, for their lives, then you got nothing to stand on, <laughs> you know? And I think that, that that is a model of of Christian behavior that I think we all would love to see, as opposed to kind of what we are witnessing now. Coming back to Tabriz, the Iranian town where Shah Muhammad Ali at this time had instituted a blockade, trying to starve the city as it's trying to hold on to its parliament. Who were Sadr Khan and Bajar Khan? And if I mispronounce their names, you'll correct me. <laughs> That's okay, yeah. Satar. Satar Khan and Bagar Khan. Satar Khan, you know, is sometimes referred to as the George Washington of the uh, Persian Constitutional Revolution, which is a, 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 a kind of a screwy uh, illusion because George Washington was a wealthy slave owning landowner and Satar Khan was an illiterate peasant horse trader and thief. <laughs> um, a, a kind of, you know, uh, a, a, a thug. He's called a luti, which is a, a kind of a gentleman bandit, basically, who ends up, he, he's in Tabriz when the, when the revolution kind of gets started. Um, ends up because of his charisma and his prowess with a gun, essentially becoming the commander of the people's army, the, the revolutionary army. He becomes this mythic figure. You know, there are like post postcards of him all over the country and, and, you know, these rumors and secrets and whispers about, you know, the magical powers that he has, that he's bulletproof, that he can't be defeated. And all of this comes from the fact that he really has this reputation as an absolutely fearless um, fighter on the battlefield. Um, and uh, that reputation starts to spread throughout the rest of the world. It's not just in, in Persia. I think the, what's truly remarkable about what happens in Tabriz is that at the time, this is the most successful anti-imperialist revolution in the world and so it starts getting the attention of the bolsheviks and and you know uh marxists and anti-imperialists so people from all over the world from georgia from russia from armenians turks arabs christians jews baha'is zoroastrians buddhists i mean everyone comes together in this town and they form this multicultural, multilingual, multi-religious revolutionary force under the leadership of Satar Khan and his right-hand man, uh, Bagar Khan. Satar and Bagar, uh, as there's this kind of wonderful moment in the book, I, I don't want to spoil it, but they, they have a little bit of a falling out. And so when Baskerville decides to join the revolution, for reasons that are still difficult to truly pin down and i and i kind of talk about all of the various you know theories that have been put forward uh he becomes second in command to satar khan he takes bagar khan's place he actually moves into satar khan's house and becomes his right hand man baskerville does baskerville Basker does yeah how, how does baskerville die T tell me about baskerville in in battle well, you know, they didn't want to give him a gun at first. Yeah, they don't want to give him a gun. Well, there's a there's a problem. So they've been begging for American assistance for years now. And America is basically telling them to go screw themselves. Like you have no choice. You know, there's no such thing as Islamic democracy. This whole thing's a fool's errand. Of course, we're not going to support you. And suddenly this American shows up. This, this young American Christian shows up and says, I'll fight for you. And so... On the one hand, he is a, an absolute boon, a, like a propaganda boon. You know, there are, there are front page articles in the New York Times and in the London Times. American joins revolution, you know. And so I think at first, Satar Khan thinks to himself, this is fantastic. Like, you know, if we can get one American, then maybe, you know, more Americans will join us. Maybe America will, will come in uh, and help us out here. Of course, that 
there's no chance that any of that happens and it doesn't happen. Um, and so at first, the thought is we have to do everything we can to keep this guy safe. We cannot let this guy die. Otherwise, that would be a disaster. But as the siege goes on, and as it becomes very clear that at this point, there are only two options, either die by starvation because of the blockade or die breaking the blockade. Um, it becomes, I think, increasingly clear that maybe one live American isn't as great as possibly one dead American. Um, so there's a lot of, in the, when you look at the historical documents, there's a lot of hand-wringing. People don't understand why. Why would Satar Khan make, a tw tw at that point, 24-year-old Christian missionary from the Midwest with no military credentials whatsoever, who basically learned everything he knows about fighting from reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. Not a joke. That's really what he learned, how he learned it. Um, why make him... It's one thing to let him join the revolution. Why make him second in command? And even then, uh, you know, there are a lot of back and forth memos between uh, in the State Department of, uh, and, and with the officials in Tabriz, American officials in Tabriz, who are positing that, oh, this is just some insidious plan to get this kid killed and use his death as some propaganda boom. Now, I've searched very very hard through the the persian documents and there's no indication that that is the case but i gotta be honest they've got a point <laughs> you know again one live american fighting next to us that's just one more gun a dead american could be a kind of symbol for us so what i do know is that over and over again, the American documents from the time make it absolutely clear that every decision that Baskerville makes was his own. That he this is what he's he was given dozens of chances to change his mind. Honestly, like they they just <laughs> almost on a daily basis go to him and say, "Stop this! Don't do this!" The church asks, the State Department asks, the school asks, everybody, and he repeatedly says no. That this is what he he's called to do. Um, but on April 20th, in 1909, there's no more food left in the city. There's really no more choice now except to break the siege. And Baskerville volunteers himself and his students, his student militia, to be sort of the tip of the spear of, of that attack. And so before the sun rises on April 20th, he and his students um, make a break for it. They try to break through the siege in order to get food to the city. And in the process of doing so, Baskerville gets shot in the heart and he dies. And exactly what I had just theorized happens. That death, the death of the American, which gets exactly the kind of attention you would imagine it would get, um, forces the Shah to end the blockade and to allow... Uh, food and medical assistance to be brought into Tabriz, the ending of the blockade is used as an opportunity for the revolutionaries to to march out of Tabriz, march to Tehran, and bring the Shah down from his throne. They throw him into exile, they re-christen um, the constitution, they rebuild the parliament, have new elections, and the new parliament's first legislative act is to declare Howard Baskerville, this 24-year-old Christian missionary from the Midwest, to be a hero and a martyr for Iran. To this day, uh, there's still a big golden bust of him in a museum in Tabriz, not far from his grave site, which for generations was a kind of pilgrimage place where people from all over the country would would go to visit and and you know see the place where this kid gave his life for a people that wasn't his, a, a cause that wasn't his. Reza Aslan, again, the name of your book is An American Martyr in Persia. Putting emphasis there, I am, on the word martyr. You're very deliberate about the use of that word. Yeah. This is a, a word that has, as you probably can guess, profound meaning in Iran. Uh, 
the primary religion of, of Iran is Shia Islam, and martyrdom in Shiism is a an elevated uh, position. Um, Shiism as a religion began with the self-sacrifice of um, the Prophet Muhammad's grandson, Hussein, on the battlefield in Karbala. He was caught in a, in a conflict against overwhelming odds, a conflict that he could not win, but that he had to fight in the name of justice, and he did, and he died. And that model of sacrificing yourself in a losing cause on behalf of the poor and the weak and the dispossessed is the foundation of Shia Islam. It is what Shia Islam is all about. And there's a very interesting lesson there that goes back to kind of what we were saying when I was talking about faith without works being dead. You know, I think Baskerville's job unquestionably was to convert the population to Christianity. That's what he had come to do, right? That was his mission. That's why the church sent him there. And in all the time that he was preaching the gospel, I've never found a single source that said he was even remotely successful. His best friend remained a faithful Muslim. All of his sort of closest students all remained faithful Muslims, and not for lack of trying. You know, he, he was preaching the gospel. He was doing what he was supposed to do. But I think he understood what Persians all sort of naturally understand, which is words don't mean anything in Iran. You can talk all you want to. P beliefs are irrelevant. Are you willing to die for those beliefs? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself for what you believe? That's when we actually care. That's when your beliefs suddenly matter. And so he was declared very clearly to be a shaheed, a martyr, um, in this kind of incredible sacred line of people who had sac willingly sacrificed themselves in the name of justice um, and in, uh, in, in, in for the oppressed and, and the marginalized. And, and that's what he remained until really post-1979 when um, this sort of anti-Americanism of the government began to gradually wipe this kid's name from the memory of all Iranians. I mean, today, even in Tabriz, it's hard to find anyone, you know, under the age of 50 uh, who has ever heard of this kid. And that's because of what happened in 1979. It is because of what happened in 1979. Yeah, his um, his memory, you know, the, the schools were replaced. Obviously, most of the street names were replaced. Um, and his memory kind of gradually faded away. I had a friend of mine who just recently went to the museum, the Constitutional Museum, and was walking around with the docent of the museum. And when they got to the Baskerville bust, my friend asked the docent about Howard Baskerville and the docent didn't know. This is the person, you know, whose job it is to actually talk about, you know, the displays in the museum. And she could talk about all of them. But when it came to Baskerville, she barely knew who this kid was. Um, that's, that's where we've gotten. And that's what I... That's really what I want to change with this book. You know, I, I want to make sure that every American and every Iranian remembers this name, Baskerville, and that this name represents all that these two people have in common with each other. Is it because, again, you have the revolution in 1979 that overthrows the constitutional monarchy that existed before, so there was a lot of discontent with that uh, form of government, which, which Baskerville is considered a martyr for, is, is that why his name is forgotten? Or is it because of the fallout after 1979 between the United States and Iran, or or maybe both? Well, one thing that I do want to just clarify is that um, it, it was no longer a constitutional monarchy. So, you know, Iranians who are listening to this story will say, well, that's a great story. What happened? Yeah, you know, they they recreated the Constitution, this incredibly progressive Constitution that gave uh, equal rights to all people in Iran, regardless of faith or gender, um, that allowed for free speech uh, and, and the conscience of thought and the separation of powers. And then also this robust parliament, you know, that had the ability to create laws 
and to limit the power of the king. Iran did become a constitutional monarchy, but only for a very short while. Um, his, you know, people who are familiar with the history know that you know. Then suddenly you have World War One uh, started. Uh, Iran became an active uh, uh, staging ground for that war between the Russian and British empires against the Ottomans and the uh, the German Empire, and uh, that war was absolutely devastating. It was followed by the Spanish flu, which killed approximately half the population of Iran, uh, and famine and disease. And then ultimately in 1924, the British government, which had now suddenly struck oil in the south of the country uh, and couldn't really deal with not just any kind of you know democratic government, but certainly an unstable democratic government, uh, encouraged a army commander by the name of Reza Khan to declare a military coup, which he did. And Reza Khan becomes Reza Shah uh, and a brand new dynasty, the Pahlavi dynasty, uh, comes into uh, play. First thing Reza Khan does is tear up that constitution and defang the parliament. He, he calls off elections and just handpicks the parliamentarians. Um, so that by the time of 1979 and Reza Khan's son, Mohammad Reza Shah, the one, who, the last Shah of Iran, uh, there is a constitution, but it's not in play at all. It's totally ignored. There is a parliament, but it's just a bunch of lackeys. Uh, by the time of 1979, we have reverted exactly back to 1906 again. It's an autocratic country ruled by the whims of a single individual um, and suppressed by the power of a absolutely ruthless police state. Um, so that's what the revolution was against. Uh, I think that's important to note. But yes, um, the anti-Americanism that followed that revolution, not just as a result of the hostage crisis, but also because of the Iran-Iraq war. I mean, again, the United States, in, in the same way that you know the British encouraged Reza Khan to declare a military coup, the United States actively encouraged and gave material support to Saddam Hussein to attack Iran um, in a war that resulted in the death of a million people on both sides. And so, as you can imagine, the level of anti-Americanism, particularly in the Iranian government, was so great that even an American hero like Baskerville could not survive. That legacy could not survive uh, the Iranian revolution. The story you tell about Tabriz in the early 20th century is, is really a fascinating story. As you were talking about it, all these people from all over the world coming to Tabriz, Tabriz I couldn't help but think and compare it in my mind to what we saw in Spain in, in, in the 1930s in the Spanish Civil right. War. No, absolutely. It becomes this kind of cause celeb, right? Like there are so many of these, especially in the early part of the 20th century, these um, anti-imperialist movements taking place in China, in Mexico, uh, certainly in Russia, obviously. There was a revolution in 1905 that didn't work, and then it worked in 1917. Um, in the midst of this battle, uh, Vladimir Lenin, who at the time is in exile in Europe, um, is reading all these reports about what's happening in Tabriz. And he realizes that this is the next revolution. This is the one. And so he sends out a call to all of his Bolshevik allies um, scattered across the Russian Empire. And he says, get, get yourself to Tabriz. Get yourself to Tabriz because that's where the fight is. Now, by the way, it's important to note that the, the, the biggest ally of the Shah was the Tsar, right? The Tsar was the one who was essentially propping up the Shah. Uh, the Tsar had his own military commanders uh, controlling the Iranian military. Um, that's how the Cossack Brigade in Iran worked. It was Persian soldiers, but Russian commanders. And they're using Russian weapons. And they're wearing Russian-made uniforms. You know, and they've got Russian tanks. Um, and 
and they're being funded by Russian rubles. That's the other thing, too, is that the Shah couldn't pay the salary of his uh, soldiers. And so the, the czar paid it for him. You know, that made him the czar's soldiers, basically. And so, you know, Lenin sends out this call and it works. Thousands of soldiers. And I don't mean like peasant soldiers, you know, like what was happening in Tabriz. I don't mean like a people's army. I mean like hardened soldiers, many of whom had fought in the 1905 revolution, start pouring into Tabriz and they bring with them knowledge, uh, bomb making techniques. You know, uh, these are these are people who actually know how to fight a guerrilla war because they fought one already against the czar. And that's what really turns the tide in this battle between Tabriz and the Shah is this international force that descends upon Tabriz. But more importantly, to your point, the revolution is fighting under this belief that you could have a different kind of society. You could have a society in which ethnicity and religion and skin color and language don't matter where you can be united simply by a set of beliefs about, you know, the role of human dignity in the political sphere. And so the Tabrizis use this international coalition to start creating a new vision for what Iran could be. They send out this um, manifesto, it's called the Nationalist Manifesto, and they send it to all the capitals of Europe and North America. And the manifesto basically says, if you open the heart of a Japanese man, won't it look exactly like the heart of a Russian? If you open the heart of a Chinese man, won't it look exactly like the heart of a Persian? We are all the same. We are all fighting for the same thing. So please put aside, quote, the bigotry of creed and instead come together as a single human, you know, uh, force and support us. It doesn't work, but it is a powerful message. And to think that that message is one that was being formulated in 1908 is, is astonishing when you think about it today. These people that are heeding the call of Lenin, are, are they bringing Marxism? Yes, they're definitely bringing a form of Marxism with them. They are... Um, bringing a form of anti-imperialism, I should say, uh, with them. Um, but they're every, you know, they're, it's like I said, it's Turks and Georgians and Armenians and Azeris and Russians and uh, Arabs. I mean, it really is just this kind of incredible global international force. Reza Azlan has been our guest. He has joined us for a conversation about his new book. It's called An American Martyr in Persia. The Epic Life and Tragic Death of Howard Baskerville. Reza Aslan, that was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for having me.